Hello, dear listeners. This is the latest episode of Freedom as in Nkulu Lego. So, China is often touted by people so sympathetic to socialist ideas as a model of how greater economic control of the economy can lead to economic prosperity. This is because China is run by a communist party, I suppose, and it is therefore assumed that all policies are socialist or communist. This has been shown to not be the case. Consider the case of Hong Kong, which is within China, but has the freest economy in the world, according to the Economic Freedom of the World Index. The truth is that China has benefited from having rational communist party politicians and bureaucrats, if there is if they such a thing, which I think in China's case they might very, very well be. These government officials and leaders have embraced markets to achieve their development goals, and this is because they have been able to see the examples all around them, places like Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, countries in Europe and North America, and they see that what, 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 what markets have been able to achieve for those places. And so if you are a communist who wants to stay in power and you want, and you want to you meet, to meet your development goals, then you adopt capitalist policies or free market policies. In China's case, this was not always the case though. But at least since the leadership of Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese have implemented greater market liberalization, which has largely been enabled by decentralization, as an, an example of which is the adoption of special economic zones. This is also the case when it comes to electricity. Since the 1980s, the Chinese embarked on a long-term energy reform program. In 2002, this program entered its state phase, which involved breaking up the state-owned power company into five power generation groups and two grid companies. Now, the interesting thing about these five power generating groups is that while state-owned, all of them have, subsi or have subsidiaries which are essentially independent power producers with shareholders and everything. And so it seems that uh, the, 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 the Chinese have managed to uh, they've managed to bring in private investment to the structure we have by allowing the what are independent power producers to pro to to compete to, uh, along with the state-owned generating companies. They've been able to bring about greater competition in their elect electricity markets, and this was done explicitly to drive efficiency and bring about lower prices. The purpose of this uh, breaking up was to introduce greater competition in the sector by breaking the previously the previous vertically integrated structure and therefore allow an equal footing for IPPs. The reforms have led to greater private investment, especially from foreigners, but there is a necessity for even greater deregulation as the, CPP, as, the, as the CCP has acknowledged. The issues with inadequate supply persist with blackouts still a problem. Now, as of 2015, China is, uh, is under, undertaking even more reforms to its energy markets. The plan here is to introduce even greater deregulation in the sector and allow even more private investment to flow not just from within China itself, but from foreign investors because they still experience supply constraints even though these have been uh, mitigated quite a bit ever since they uh, embarked on this on this third phase of the reforms in 2002 they still experience quite a bit of problems but unlike uh, many other places may, maybe an example of which would be South Africa the Chinese ex recognize that the market is a solution rather than an enemy here. They recognize that they, they need them, the market to solve this problem for them because the, the state simply just can't, can't, can't drive efficiency, can't bring about the necessary changes that are, are required, can't uh, introduce the necessary cost containment measures. So you need markets to drive competition in order to drive the, the necessary efficiencies. And that's what the Chinese are doing. And but before you can get there, you also have some guarantee of property rights. And this is where the Chinese model of decentralized decision-making at local level, autonomous regions, provinces, and at all those other, at, at all those levels, that's where it helps because it allows, let's say the autonomous, the autonomous region to decide the particular form of regulation that will be prevalent in that particular region. 
it even allows them to set particular property rate property rights uh, property rights protection measures for a particular region and so this this allows for them to bring in to bring in private investors who will know that their money is safe if they invest in china's electricity industry it's just interesting to me that uh, as between 2002 and 2005, China experienced their version of what we could call load shedding, where there was inadequate inadequate supply to meet the the needs of a, of, the, of China's growing economy. They still experienced those problems, but they have been to some extent made, made mitigated quite a bit by the introduction of private players in the industry, and we, which has culminated in them doubling their capacity every seven years which is an outstanding, outstanding number. I mean, the state still has a role for setting prices, which is what, which is why they're now thinking of uh, having a, a, a spot price market for energy, which will allow basically the market to set the price. We will see where the Chinese reforms go, but they seem to have a radically different philosophy to what the South African government is pursuing. And from the, as we can see from the Chinese and the, the lessons that they are less learning as they are going along, it seems the market wins yet again. And thank you, dear listeners. I'll catch you next week.